So today's reading is Joyce Rubin's um, The Marriage of Maria Brown, History, Melodrama, Ideology. Um, and just to begin, uh, she's charting out the sort of ascendancy um, or ascendant of um, uh, uh, Reiner Werner Fassbinder um, in the late 70s, right? And this is a very, very familiar trajectory for us at this point, right? Where it's the trajectory of the in of international art cinema, that um, other than kind of mainstream commercial narrative filmmakers, when you are making, especially um, uh, um, again, kind of this. We don't mean in the sort of abstract, vague art cinema, but art cinema as a historical practice um, internationally that mostly circulates in film festivals and art house uh, theaters um, as a particular mode, let's say, of filmmaking then you do need to kind of um, hit the sort of uh, the circuit, right? And once you um, uh, kind of are able to, am you know, amass any sort of momentum on that circuit, we see, you know, what it does for, for these filmmakers. And Fassbinder is, is no, you know, is, is no different. Um, 1979 Berlin Film Festival specifically, and then also winning the Federal Film Prize. But again, I've kind of insisted on this again and again that this doesn't really happen as much, but we see it happening, especially around like the 70s. And I do think that like the kind of, I've, I've, as I've insisted, the political times really and the historical, you know, like what's going on in the, in the world at that point really does play a major part um, is that he has critical and commercial success. Right. And, um, you know, that's not to say that something like. I'm just going to beat up on these films again. Avengers, you know, doesn't have critical success, but it's it's not exactly the same, right? I mean, these films are not the Avengers, right? But a lot of these films that we've been watching and talking about have been, you know, sort of watched by the general public, but also, you know, um, let's say the 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 people that are that are a little bit more selective about about their their media practices. Um, so this is, you know, we're talking about a general audience that's much more open to art cinema, um, and this just doesn't really, um, this isn't really the case anymore as much. Uh, Rubin talks about on four, so this is a point that's kind of been consistently coming up about, you know, like, one way to put it in this case is like, what's so German about New German cinema? Um, but this is, you know, like, um, uh, in the first full paragraph, this idea of his work, his, his work after um, uh, Maria Brown being intensely German, but this like it being intensely German is not again some sort of abstract, um, vague essentialist like as if it's you know DNA and like you know German and blood right. It's like it, it's it's rather it's in subject subject material in script in locations and with German technical crews um, and casts. That's what makes it German. These are very like historically specific things. They're not some sort of like ephemeral kind of, you know, um, transcendental quality that, you know, like just separates. Um, because, because it does, especially in a, in a place like Germany during this period, um, now it's a unified Germany. So when we talk about like essentially German now, it's very, very different from talking about like then where it's like what's West German and East German are. It's, it would be the same as like if you think about like today for us, South Korea and North Korea, these are just completely different, you know, um, uh, uh, like versions of Korea, right? Like North Korean isn't really considered to be Korean at all, you know, by, 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 by the, the, the world at large, right? But to imagine like before, you know, World War II, it was only one Korea. So what was essentially or or intensely Korean meant both, you know, both like the entire peninsula. But that changed, right? Um, if reunification ever happens, that'll change again. So these things are historically contingent, right? It's not something that's kind of eternally um, sort of uh, designated, right? Um, and, and more specifically, this is a filmmaker that's dedicated to the individual, domestic, and social ills of Western German society. So talking about the divided Germany after World War II, um, and specifically thinking about, you know, the kind of everyday difficulties in living in that country, in that world, right? And so there's, you know, um, this comes up a lot with, with these sort of filmmakers, but this idea of like a historical consciousness, right? 
you know, if it's not clear, I take very seriously that this is not international cinema too, but history of international cinema, right? And so sort of being conscious and sort of aware and critical and having a sort of historical perspective as again, as you've heard me say over and over, as opposed to an ahistorical perspective, right? So this is still on four, um, German history, social and cultural continuities. This is going to be a very, very big um, theme today where he's thinking about continuity or things continuing on He's thinking about things being on a continuum, right? This is not a selective or convenient way of understanding history, where he's simultaneously trying to suggest that there's some sort of eternal, timeless sense of Germanness, right, or Germany, but that one that conveniently skips over the elephant in the room, which is Nazism, right? It is trying to think about how something like Nazism um, is informed by the past and informs the present moment. It's, this is an incredibly rigorous way of understanding you know, one's own time and place um, in, in, in relation to um, Again, the broader context, right, and 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 one's own, you know, home country, right, uh, <clears throat> uh, and 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 you know, like I mean, you could, like that kind of consistency, right, that kind of coherence, right. We'll kind of get into it further. Um, I do think, I mean, I'm I'm kind of stumbling around right now because I just woke up basically, and I still haven't had enough coffee, um, and trying to talk about really really difficult things at the, and for me, what is top of the morning? It's really not morning. I won't tell you what time it is. Um, but um, this is uh, the kind of enormity of this point is something that I want to sort of just like put out there and, and, and we'll kind of work through it a little bit more. But he grapples with Nazism, this is on page five, um, that for Fassbender, um, he wants to show that first partial paragraph, the last few lines, that national socialism wasn't an accident but a logical extension of the German bourgeoisie's attitudes which haven't altered to this day. Like, think about how um, enormous and, and, and sort of uh, the magnitude of that thought where it's like something as horrible as, as Nazism and as, as the Third Reich uh, National Socialism, he's not trying to explain it away. He's not trying to like kind of um, make an excuse for it. Like, think about out, like, the t like the sort of atrocities that, that we have we as Americans have been a part of, and, and there's always this kind of tendency to treat it as like a one-off. He's trying to say is like, no, that was going to happen because Nazism is at the sort of core of German bourgeoisie, uh, like bourgeois, like the bourgeoisie, like bourgeois ide ideology, and those like the, the things that sort of inform Nazism are still with us today, right? Um, it's not something that we've gotten rid of. Whereas with us, like especially in the U.S., we want to treat something like, oh, we're so past racism, right? A lot of, most of us think that way. We don't treat it as this sort of thing that's still here. Or we do treat it as something that we still deal with, but we always treat it as something that um, someone else is, is the problem. Someone else is the one that's the problem. I've already like gotten my, my house in order, you know, my shit's together. Whereas Fassbender, and this is such why, why again, he's I think this is he's such a kind of important figure for us at this point in the semester. Ruben points out like no, like he's talking about his own positionality. So when he says like Germans, he's talking about himself. When he says German bourgeoisie ideology, he's talking about himself. And this goes back to um, French, you know, again, Saint Benet, uh, French Algeria. Um, Fanon, Sartre, all of these people are talking about, not, they're not talking about those people over there are the problem, they're talking about how historically that has precisely been the problem, is that all of us are saying that those people are the problem. And people like Sartre, people like Fanon, um, uh, people like Fassbender are saying like, wait a minute, but what about me? What is in my heart? What is in my mind? What is in my culture? Right? What are the things that I've kind of picked up, consciously or unconsciously? Right? Um, and, and how does that fit into, you know, a history of suffering, basically, a history of colonialism, um, a history of, you know, horrible atrocity, right? 
So you can see why, like, you know, I, to me, I'm just very empathetic of this. Um, okay. And just one kind of quick point before we move on. Um, but what uh, uh, Fassbinder and the other um, New German filmmakers were really grappling with is they're really grappling with the sins of their fathers and mothers, right? Where, and Ruben points this out, and we'll get there in a second, but this idea that, um, you know, the, the, the actual Germans who were, who were um, you know, living through um, the Third Reich, you know, um, this kind of sense that they couldn't really grapple with their own actions while they were going on. And so you see this kind of, like, deferral onto the, you know, their, their children. And it's their children's sort of um, um, kind of, uh, you know, the legacy that's passed on to the children for them to kind of process and understand and deal with, like, what their country and very literally, you know, their parents have done, right? You know, to kind of, um, and, and for Fassbender, the way that he's doing that is through his cinema, right? Um, I think this is another way, another lesson for us to be learned about our own historical atrocities, and of course I'm thinking about the eradication of, na of, of the Native Americans and or, um, you know, um, slavery uh, in, in the U.S. And, and, and oftentimes we hear this kind of, this, this sort of, again, it's a very, it's a, it's, it's a different sort of deferral, it's like a dipla displacement where it's like, but I didn't do that, um, um, I had no part in that, you know. Um, uh, uh, that wasn't my family, you know, those are my ancestors, maybe, I, haven't, I don't know. I don't think that's the way to go about it, nor I don't think it's really a, a, this kind of like framework of direct sort of guilt, right, um, and culpability as if like we're asking each other to pay like directly for the sins um, uh, of, our, of our fathers and, and mothers, so much as like what, what you know, Fassbender's talking about, is like, but to recognize that one has a place in the continuity and in the continuum where no, you're not directly responsible or guilty for those past actions, but that doesn't mean our hands are totally clean either, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, we're kind of um, really getting into it. And again, that's why I think this is such a, uh, uh, you know, you won't hear me use language like this that often, but, um, a marvelous chapter. So, um, okay, let's kind of take a minute and then we'll move on to talking about class consciousness in, in Fassbender.